How you doing there? This is my second Mazda 6 review. Why? Because they keep updating this damn car to keep it competitive and to make it better. We're gonna talk about the good, the bad, and why I am starting to think this is one of the best mid-sized cars currently on the market. Let's take a look. Now you've been looking at the exterior and regardless what you think of the styling, the grill, the rear end, you gotta hand it to Mazda. At this price point, nobody does a red paint job this well. And yes, it's gonna cost more to repaint it or to do touch-ups because it's more complicated of a paint process, but it transforms a vehicle that's kind of just very smooth into something that's more eye-catching, namely in good light. God, does it look good. Now, we can talk about the exterior, let's not anymore. The interior space is where this vehicle has started to really step up its game. With the signature version, it's about $36,000. And at $36,000, you gotta wonder why you would go and spend Audi, Mercedes, and BMW money for like 50 grand when this interior space has gotten so good. You have wood materials on the doors and the dashboard. You have this almost Alcantara-ish uh, suede on the, the dashboard with real stitching. The bezel around the infotainment screen is not just tacked on and totally generic. The start button has its own kind of bezel. You have this two-tiered kind of upper dashboard that's soft and then the middle part is leather wrapped with this vent design that looks more alloy. And you know, I like this so much and one of the reasons why I like Audi and BMW is it just their interiors have this feel of craftsmanship. Now that Mazda is doing this, I think more people should look at this because you save so much money. The perceived quality, what it looks like on the interior is top notch. Now I say perceived quality because everything appears to fit together well. There's no creaks or rattles yet. And that's because this is a brand new car so I can't speak to how it's gonna hold up. But on the flip side, there's still some problems here from the previous Mazda 6 that I got into. Like the neutering of the armrest space, because they wanted to change out the center layout to add this electronic parking brake, more cup holder area, and it just it's harder to get comfortable with your right arm. That hasn't changed. You have piano gloss black plastic in this high traffic area where the shifter is, and it does get very dusty and scratched up. And there's a little bit of piano gloss black plastic in other areas, but it's not horribly out of place. Now, back to the positives. The shifter, they still have not gone away to the digi stick where you don't know what gear you're in. You can physically move this and feel what gear you're in. You know what gear you're in. I, I like that a lot and I can't tell you how much I like that. It does have paddle shifters and you can switch it into manual mode down here or you can just kind of hit a gear and switch to whatever you want, whenever you want. Now I'm gonna shut this door and talk about one thing. A lot of people complained about Mazdas being noisy and they kind of fixed this with the CX-5 new generation and I feel like they've addressed it here in the Mazda 6. I don't know if it's just placebo, but it definitely feels like a more refined a refined space. There's less road noise, there's less ambient noise that gets on the inside. And I think this is why I'm saying, at least in terms of interior quality, this rivals those entry level luxury cars now. When you get in here and you, you start to look at things like the HVAC control structure, now they've added cooled seats that actually work. Everything is down here. Nothing can be controlled by the touch screen. Everything is logically laid out. Most of the controls, buttons, and switches are extremely easy to figure out. The gauge cluster, my God. This is how you implement a digital display and analog gauges. And not only that, one of the most impressive parts about this is, and I was playing around with this at night, is how uniform they were able to get the brightness levels between the digital display and the analog gauges. As you ramp up the brightness or turn it down, they're almost identical in terms of light output. 
Now there is some color difference between the center gauge cluster and the obviously analog gauges. They couldn't match the whites perfectly, but this looks really good and traditional while still combining some of the best of modern technology. And what doesn't make sense is you really can't customize this gauge cluster enough. Like you have some redundancy in some of the gauges, like the fuel gauge, you can't really customize the center screen as much. You know, there's more work to be done here, but I'm sure that they're gonna figure this out. Now the infotainment. I was a current generation Mazda 3 owner where they first debuted this, and I had high hopes for it. Why? Because it's open source. You could add applications to it. You could do a lot to it. It's quick, and for the most part, it's easy to use in some cases. But what has Mazda done? Zilch. And this is the big problem that I talk about constantly with modern vehicles. If a manufacturer decides they're not gonna update it, you're pretty much screwed or finding somebody that has hacked it up and added things like they've added Android Auto to certain firmware versions of this. But you shouldn't have to do that as a customer. So I hope Mazda gets their act together with that. I'm sure they're working on it now. Now the other part is the HUD. They finally integrated it into the dash and yes, it's increased the dashboard height a little bit, but it looks good, it's clear, and I hate using it. And I always want to turn it off. And in this car, much like the previous Mazda 6, you have to turn it off in the infotainment and it doesn't remember that you've turned it off. So you have to turn it off every time you use the car. I think a quick solution to that would be you have plenty of extra space down here with uh, buttons you could add like Audi does, Lexus does. They put a spot where you can adjust the HUD with a physical control or just turn it off. That would solve this problem. And one of the main reasons you get a sedan, oh, f <laughs> is to hit your goddamn head getting in. Oh, so, all right, there's a ton of headroom once you get in, but you just have to duck a little bit. That's my own dumb fault. But comfort is a big element of the Mazda 6. The seats are really good, whether it doesn't matter your size. The front seats have amazing adjustability. Like I said, the heated and cooled seat options honestly work. You have heated seats back here in the armrest and you have you have individual vents, but no manual, you know, you don't have your own control, just the vent control. For the most part, you're gonna enjoy driving in this car front or rear pretty much all the time. The only thing that they could probably figure about adding, you know, people are gonna complain about it, is it doesn't have a panoramic sunroof. The LED light color temperature is way too blue. It looks like refrigerator lighting. I mean, there's just subtle tweaks they can probably make over time, but this is about as good as you're gonna get in this price range. Now I met my friend Jericho's mom at a latte convention. She's like, well, what's the Mazda 6 trunk like? Well, I told her it's pretty immense. Um, I could fit a lot of stuff in here, as you would expect. Putting the seats down is pretty easy. And when you get everything opened up in here, I mean, she fit in here. Well, it sounds like I'm Japanese for this video. Jack Tokyo here with the uh, 2018 Mazda 6. So this car is a, a mid-cycle refresh. So the Mazda 6 shares Mazda's global architecture. It uses the uh, Mazda 3's, CX-5, and CX-9's chassis underpinnings. So for this year, in 2018, Mazda, for their second mid-cycle refresh of the Mazda 6, decided to reduce NVH. It's most consumers' primary complaint with the prior years. So what they did for this is they added additional underbody body coating to this, as well as uh, they've added isolation dampers to the front struts. A noteworthy change for 2018 is Mazda decided to hard mount the steering rack to the lower subframe carrier in the Mazda 6. By doing this, Mazda is hopefully granting owners uh, increased steering feel. But to balance out the potential increased NVH, Mazda's now made the lower control arm bushings fluid filled. <clears throat> so when it comes to the rear of the vehicle, my cousins abroad decided not to uh, slack off that much. Yes? Get out here. Look who decided to grace us with his presence. Yes, how can I help you? The prodigal son returns. No. How was couples counseling, Mr. Bowski? It's not funny. I was having my bi-weekly defecation. There's a lot more that's been done to the Mazda 6, Jack, to get real excited about. And the majority of everything they've done for this refreshed Mazda 6 is a lot more than they would do for a normal car. They've 
changed suspension hard mounting points. They've changed dampers with less stiction in the seals. They've changed bushings. They've reinforced the floor pan metal. They've put additional hardening and stiffening in various places that you can't even see. And then of course, reducing NVH was the majority of what they were trying to achieve here. There is suspension changes to reduce the amount of toe that's in the front suspension and it, it's all working together the front and rear suspension so basically the car doesn't understeer as much you're putting all this torque and extra horsepower in this car and they had to make a lot of changes and we talked about that it would be a mess if they didn't make all oh, this it'd be unbearable to drive yeah as is i mean there's almost no torque steer when you drive this car there's very minimal torque steer but we're going to talk a lot about that when we start driving this car on the road let's take a look at the engine bay Ooh. you finally get your heart rate up yeah, about 57 beats a minute. This thing is hot. Oof. I'm talking temperature wise because it's like 120 degrees under here right now. The 2.5 liter turbo motor in here, it is a big improvement. And that's one of the biggest complaints I had with the initial Mazda 6 review is you only had one engine option. And the 2.5 liter in there, I know people argued this, but it felt like a dog to me. And it wasn't that it was a bad car, you just needed another option. How does option. this feel then, Mark? Feels like a bigger dog. Oh, it does? Yeah, it's woofing. <laughs> how, how does it feel? Does it, does it fulfill that void that the last Mazda 6 left in your, the bowels of your heart? Yes, this is, makes, it transforms this car. And I think not only just putting the motor in here, they had to do other things, which we've already talked about. The combination of all these the NVH reduction, the suspension changes to make this usable is great. The noteworthy thing to note, to, to, to bring up at least, is that you can use regular gasoline in this, which is a huge benefit to it is. the average driver. Yeah, absolutely. And I just got out of a couple uh, luxury cars where you didn't have that option. You had to put premium in. And you know, I drove it and I'm like, it's not exciting enough of an experience for me to justify the extra cost. Where here, you can use regular fuel and you're gonna lose 20 horsepower off the top number. But when you use premium fuel, if you want that, you, get tw you, you gain that 20 horsepower back, but the torque stays the same whether you use regular or, you know. And torque's what you feel most of the time when you're driving. Yeah, for mo that, that's why they did it. They understand that the regular customer is gonna drive below 4,000 RPMs all the time and they want all that, that torque and power down low and that's exactly what this delivers. So let's get out of the shop and get into the car. Now, much like the last Mazda 6 I drove, you can tell this car has a lot of refinement, more than you would expect from a car that kind of has its roots and more fun to drive. And that's one of the things they've tried to change with this most recent update. They know that people complain that it's a little bit too noisy, that it was a little bit too firm. And to me, it just feels like they found the right balance between trying to be more of that luxury car while still giving you a little bit of spirit when you drive it. Now, most of the people, what you're really gonna care about here is what is it like to finally have a turbocharged motor, some real horsepower to move this car. And you know, when I drove the original 2.5, that was my biggest complaint. It was just too slow for what it was. And it was a great option for somebody that just wanted great fuel economy, but if you wanted to drive it harder, it wasn't a lot of fun. So now what happens when you push down the gas is this thing moves. And because of the way the power band is, it gives you that instant sense of gratification. There's torque instantaneously as soon as you hit the gas. And the way that the transmission is programmed and the way that it delivers all that power is right in that usable street driving area. Now here's the negative part about putting all that torque, 300 pounds of torque and horsepower down low where you're gonna use it every day. Every time you mash on the gas and turn, this thing wants to rip its front tires right off the, uh, right off the ground. 
and it's one of the most frustrating parts of the modern age of low RPM power delivery because as soon as you mash on it and you get all that torque no matter what you do with the traction control system no matter what you do with how you take away the power electronically it's still going to overwhelm the tires namely these tires and it, it can really be one of the biggest negative parts of driving the Mazda 6. Now in terms of handling and driving and in general the way that they have the stability and traction control set up on here, including the G-vectoring control, which somewhat dials back the amount of torque that the engine is producing to kind of straighten the line and continue on the intended path of your steering angle, uh, all of it works exceptionally well. And one of the biggest things I'm going to say about Mazda is they have spent real time tuning this. I just got out of the most recent Hyundai vehicles and Kia vehicles where they're trying to do the same thing with their turbochargers, give you all that instant gratification. And then as soon as you brake traction, it just turns everything off. The Mazda progressively pulls back the power. Every time it senses wheel slip, it, it slowly dials it back. It doesn't just turn it off. So you gradually get it back and it doesn't interfere with the driving experience. And the way that the ECU's tune for the, the transmission is also super intelligent because it knows where you're in that power band where it's going to disrupt the handling of the vehicle and it will auto upshift where it needs to, much like you would do in a manual transmission car. And for one of, really, that's one of the main reasons why I'm a huge advocate of Mazda vehicles from a driving perspective. They know how to set up cars to have a little bit of fun and still give you the refinement. Now, people are going to ask, well, it only has six gears. Well, who cares if it has six gears? The six gears work extremely well. Taking off, the car short shifts pretty much every single time. It's going to shift at 5,000 or 5,500 RPMs when you're in fully automatic mode, which means in drive, no sport mode, no traction control off, and it it always is short shifting, probably for fuel economy, and also you can feel the power falling off at the high end. This is not a car that you want to wind out. Now I'm going to turn the traction control off with just the one touch, and I'm going to put the transmission in manual mode, and this is the only way you can control the gears manually. If you leave the traction control on, it will auto upshift. This will not auto upshift when you do it this way. The red line or fuel cutoff seems like it's right about at 5,900 RPMs. And this thing kind of just loses steam at the upper end, even when you're using the premium fuel. And it's, it's gonna depend on what type of person you are. For me, I want a car that progressively builds power and I get power at the top end. I don't like this instant gratification. I feel like it interferes with the overall driving experience. But Mazda's done research, these other companies have done research and they found that most people don't drive and wind out the engine. They just put it off the line and they usually have it, you know, only get about 3,000 RPMs. And if that's the way that you're driving, this is going to be an amazing experience because you feel like the car is so fast and so capable that you're, you're not going to notice kind of the weirdness about how this is tuned. But again, you know, when you want to pound it around, if you're somebody that wants to have a little bit of fun, that's what you're going to have to deal with every time you mash on the gas, whether it's with the traction control on or the traction control off, this wants to rip its tires off. And when I said, I brought this up about the CX-9, I'm like, there's no way that Mazda's going to put this turbocharged motor in the Mazda 6 or the Mazda 3. It would be a mess. And I kind of pull that back because it's not a total mess. And the reason it is not a mess is because they've pulled all the juice out of this motor. It has so much more capability than what you feel like when you're driving. It's constantly dialing back the power to make sure that the driving experience is not a total disaster. Now I've had this on track and I'm going to show you some footage here and the car was really, really good on track. I didn't have any brake problems. The only thing is it just feels so refined now that you don't get this sense of uh, connectedness with the car like some of the old Mazdas and Mazda's gonna hate to hear this because they cannot win 
it's people complaining it's too noisy, you feel too much, and then people like me who want more complain that you don't feel enough. And I think there is a good balance here, but this is certainly not a, a vehicle you're gonna go pounding around. This is not some Mazda speed car. This is not some track car, but it is exceptionally good when you see how well the suspension set up, how well the transmission's programmed. It's super quick. Uh, it, it allows you really kind of the best of everything that you want in a mid-sized car. And that's why to me, between the engine programming, the suspension setup, a little bit of steering, the great ride quality, the road noise and isolation, this is pretty much my favorite mid-sized car now. And a lot of the people that have been in this car and the other people I've talked to seem to agree that this should be a top choice. Final thoughts on the Mazda 6. Now people have been wondering when they were gonna bring back the turbo motor in a car, and they've done it. And it's not what you would expect. In fact, I've driven this on the street, on the track, and this is definitely more of a cruiser, more of a pretty much the most refined car they've ever made. And there's pluses and minuses to that. But the biggest thing is this is going to kind of change people's expectations of what you should get in this mid $30,000 price range, because this definitely feels more like a luxury car to me. The damping is great without having to resort to adjustable suspension or air suspension. The steering is still pretty good. The transmission performance is great without having to go to eight or ten gears. The fuel economy still remains pretty pretty better than average really. And I don't know, there's not a ton to complain about. My biggest issue with this car is Mazda has now reached this level where I don't know how much more they can do with front wheel drive. With 300 pounds of torque, you know, pushing 240, 50 horsepower, it's almost time to take the next generation all wheel drive or preferably create a really solid rear wheel drive platform. And I think this will take them to the next level to compete with some of those big boys if they even want to do that. Because there's just way too much now that they have to do with electronic control of power output, uh, all the tricks that they're doing with that, the transmission control and all the logic. I'd like to see them you know, branch out and get just keep getting better and better. But as this stands, this is now the first car I would look at in the midsize segment. This, the Honda Accord, the Camry, and the Kia Optima are pretty much my favorite cars out there. And I hope this helps. Take care. I'll see you next time.